As you're able, please remain standing for the reading of the Gospel. A reading from the Gospel of Luke in the 14th chapter. Now large crowds were traveling with him. And he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to oppose one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. Well, this is the first Sunday of the month, and so we'll celebrate Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, as we learned a few minutes ago. And uh, even though it's not Monday, Thursday. And uh, the only thing we ask in the United Methodist Church is that you answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all that love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful, Merciful God. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In just a few minutes, I'll invite the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings, and Anne will play something beautiful for us too. Uh, I want to say I'm just eternally grateful for the faithfulness of our church. It is, uh, we're slowly but surely coming back to, to having better attendance. Things are getting better. The world is getting whatever the world is. And, uh, but we, we thank you for finding time out to not only come, but to be faithful in, in your attendance and your giving here at the church. Uh, at this time, I invite the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts and our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we are so blessed. We have a great place to come. We have great friends. We have a great church. And you give us the opportunity to support not only our church, but our community and people all around the world through our gifts. So today, take our gifts and use them. Use them to glorify your name in this community and throughout the whole world in the name of Jesus Christ.
may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning for the message comes from Jeremiah in the 18th chapter. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Come go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare something may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And in another moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build up and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do it. Now therefore say to the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, Look, I'm a potter, shaping evil against you, devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I entitled this message today, Reformatting or Rerouting. Anybody here have a GPS that talks to you? I turned mine off because I don't want to listen to it. It keeps telling me I'm not going where I'm supposed to. I'll make a left turn. It says I should have turned right. It said rerouting. And I wonder if that's not what this scripture is about in Jeremiah, that, that this potter has this potter's wheel and he, and he starts making something and that something isn't just right, so he just crumbles it all up and starts over. And so many times in the church, it seems like we're unable to let people really start over. To let people really begin wherever they are, whatever has happened to them, whatever darkness has been in their life, whatever it was, and move to a place of creating a new vessel, something that God intended, that God wanted them to be. Or maybe even that God wants us to be. And I think that for me, that really is the message that Jesus brings. Is it doesn't matter who you were or what you were or what you did previously. It's not important. What's important is that you're here and that you're moving forward as a new vessel. Something created better than it was initially. I don't think God makes mistakes. But sometimes we don't follow through on God's direction. Or maybe we just don't even listen. Amen. You know, I, I can tell you that many times in my younger days... I can still remember those. Uh, in my younger days, I wasn't asking God if I was doing the right thing first. I didn't go to God and say, well, do you think I ought to date this girl or, or ought to participate in that activity? And I was doing stuff with the crowd in some cases. Everybody else was doing it, so I thought I'd do it. And we live in, in such a crazy time right now. We need a couple of places in our lives where we can leave the world aside and go there in spite of, or instead of, or no matter what else is going on. When we walk through the doors of the church into the narthex or the vestibule or the lobby, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's really designed to be a way of, of cleansing ourselves of the animosity and the angst and the animus of the world and walk in cleansed into the sanctuary or the worship center or a place where we can be one in the body of Christ. Now, I've been a Methodist for a long time. I remember when I was a kid, my dad was the board chair at our church. And so he had a discipline, the rule book, the law book of us Methodists. I had a whole seminary class on how to read it. It's complicated. But it, it, it says some really interesting things. As we talked about in our trivia moment, the Methodist church has a pretty strong stance on drinking. Why? Because, well, alcohol screws up a lot of lives. But we also know that we're not rigid about it in the sense that if you, you know, 
I remember one time we were at the grocery store and the person in front of me didn't realize that I knew them or that they were a church member. And we got up there and they had some wine in there and suddenly they started to shuffle stuff around in the basket so I wouldn't see it. <laughs> You know, I, I'm not going to condemn people if they're one of those folks in life that can have a beer or two or a glass of wine or a couple of drinks and move on. But we also know that there are some people that, that have a problem. And so we, we've got to be in that balance of, of not being rigid. We don't want to be a church that says, well, if you had anything to drink in the last week, you can't come to church. That keeps people out. That doesn't keep people in. The same thing is true about it. Not, a, not just that many things about our, our stance on gambling. We have a stance, but, but we're not rigid about it. We know that gambling is bad. A lot of people ruin their lives over it. And that publicly, that's the stance we take. But we know that there's a whole ton of people that get great enjoyment about going over to Lake Charles or Shreveport or Las Vegas, having a vacation. And probably the people we're talking about are not spending the money they would have spent on baby shoes. But anytime you go, you also need to know that there are people there that are doing that. When I worked for Quest, we, our national sales meeting every year was at uh, the Bellagio. And uh, I remember uh, uh, being with a group of friends and we were in one of the casinos and we were uh, playing some of the games and one of the guys there kept running out of money. And he kept going up and they'd cash a check right there in Vegas. They'd be glad to take his money. And he kept going back and going back and going back. And finally they told him, said, son, you don't have enough money in your bank account to cash another check because they know those things too. So we know that there are those issues. And, and so I can assure you somewhere in the world today, there is a church that is saying, you know, you can't come here if you do those things. And we wonder why church attendance is down. And we're not about where you were. How in the world are we ever going to change the world, transform the world, which is what our mission statement says, if we don't associate with people that have issues? I mean, truthfully, don't we have issues too? Or maybe y'all don't. I do. A couple. I've even been wrong once. <laughs> or twice. But I think sometimes, well, Kathy points it out more often than that, but, uh, but I think sometimes we don't realize how quickly we can get into this place where we want you to be a part as long as you think like I think and do what I think. I, I was joking earlier, I told some people, well, you know, if, if I could just be in charge for 20 minutes, I could change things. But I wouldn't want it for more than 20 minutes because the 21st minute, people would hate me. I think we have to, to realize that that the world uh, is going to do whatever the world does. I'm pretty sure the world has always done what the world's doing. And we need a place where we come to, to a place where we leave all that stuff aside and we don't look at people and say, well, I think they, I think they are, or politically, I think they're on that side. I'm not going to talk to them. You know, when we come in here, who cares? When we come into this place, who really cares about that stuff? What we care about is bringing people into the kingdom so that they can find eternal life and spend eternity with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's what we care about. And this is the place where we can do that. Yes. Now, there's a few other places in the world where you could go that are apolitical, but there's very few of them today. I mean, you can be in the line at the grocery store and find a political conversation. And, and so, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be involved in politics. I think we should. I think we should vote. We should be a part of knowing who we're voting for. I, I had a young lady some years ago call me and said, would you sign a petition for this candidate that I'm supporting? And I said, no. But I'm really proud of you for doing it. And I said, but understand that I would be just as proud as, as another young person that was on the opposing side being involved in politics because we're told Jesus tells us to be involved in what's going on around us you know when you look at an election I was talking to the, the health person up at, at uh, City Hall this week when you look at an election in a city that's I don't know how many people we really have 180,000 I don't know well, it's a bunch when you look at a city like that if we have an election that's won by 3,000 I mean, there's only 3,000 people to vote there's something wrong and, and, and so I, I really don't care which side you're on. Be on the side, be on no side, but vote. Be a part. We, we can't change the world if we don't infiltrate the community and get out involved, ask questions, 
Find out what people stand for. Find out what they believe. But you got to know what you believe too. And you can, if you don't know what your beliefs are about stuff, that's the reason we have this book. That's the reason we come to church. It's the reason we hang out with people that we don't know so well sometimes and get their opinions. It's the reason we open ourselves up to hear whatever somebody says. This is a place where that can happen and we don't go away hating each other and not liking each other. That cleansing that happens as you go through the entryways, it's, it's almost like you, you, you know, you, when you go out, if you, if you saw it, as, you see those people on TV that go into those contaminated sites where they have to wear the white suits, you know, and, and they have to get washed off when they leave. And maybe you could start to see that as what's happening as you walk into the church, that, that you're being cleansed of the world as you come into here so you can be reformed like that potter's wheel. You can be formed into that vessel that gives you at least a few minutes to be what God wants you to be, not what the world expects. And Jesus is pretty rash about it, isn't he, in Luke, when he says, yeah, you may have to hate other people. He doesn't mean to hate them, I don't think, in the sense of not talking to them or being around them, but you've got to pick and choose who you're going to follow. And when it comes down to it, you know, I, I say this all the time about politicians. Friends, they're not coming to your funeral. <laughs> You know, uh, are we going to spend time worrying about stuff that we don't control that we can't do? Or are we going to spend time on the stuff that we have a say about? And our relationship with Jesus Christ is what's going to lead us to eternity. But not just when we die, but, but until we die. So that we see people differently. We act different. We, we see people hurting when they're hurting. I'm always amazed that Jesus seems to find the most work to do with the sickest people. I didn't forget what I was saying. That's just soaking in. Kind of like that rain we got. Just soaking in. Jesus works with the, the prostitutes and the sinners. And He never gives up hope. And even some little short tax collector called Zacchaeus gets his whole household converted because he's nosy and wants to see what Jesus is doing. Friends, there are people all over this world in this community that want that. They just don't know what they know. In fact, they don't know what they don't know. And if we don't show them who's going to, if we don't walk away from some of those conversations, if we don't sometimes uh, just not respond, Thomas Henderson, some of you will remember Thomas, he used to play for the Cowboys. Uh, he, he was a, a great linebacker. Uh, in reality and in his own mind. <laughs> Uh, Thomas Henderson is an acquaintance of mine, and one of the things he told me years ago when I first got sober, which is, you know, this is like 32 years ago, 33 years ago, something like that. He said, you know, uh, there's a place in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous which says we have to painstakingly take a look at who we are. Now, I always understood painstaking to mean like, you know, persnickety, picky, you know, but what he suggested to me was sometimes it hurts. Sometimes we have to take the pain of our past to realize that we need to be reformatted on the potter's wheel. If we don't realize how far we've gone down the dark path, we don't know. And so there needs to be some self-reflection, some opportunity to take a look at who we are, who we've been, and who God wants us to be. I believe God wants good things for everyone. I wish everyone would make godly and righteous decisions. I wish I would always make godly and righteous decisions. But sometimes we make decisions with, without thinking, without paying attention to God, without listening to God. There's some places in the Old Testament where some of those kings, they, they decide to take advantage of this thing about looking at the enemy and seeing how many there are. And so they make deals. But they don't consult God first before they make the deals. And so they end up making treaties and agreements with people that ultimately lead to their demise. Sometimes we're just like that. It's so much easier to follow the path of least resistance. I was telling people earlier when, when I was in high school, there were times when well, I'd be with four or five different people and they'd say, let's go do this. And I know we shouldn't do it. We really shouldn't be doing that. But I didn't have enough influence to change it. And rather than walk away, I went. And I'm the kind of guy that gets caught. 
I'm the guy that gets three days off before the Christmas holidays from school because I was with the guys that did what they did. Actually, he didn't do anything. I just was with them. I knew better. I knew I shouldn't have done that. I knew it wasn't what I was supposed to do. I'm seeing a couple of head shakes, so I'm assuming somebody else has been in that place before, too. <laughs> so what I know is that, that there's hope. There's hope for the future. There's hope for this church. There's hope for the big C church, the, the total church. But we can't go along and say, yeah, but, but uh, sometimes I even wonder if we do it right at all. Bishop Huey and later Bishop Jones said, you know, the United Methodist Church is perfectly positioned in the Texas Annual Conference if the 50s ever come back. But they're not. We're not going to have plug-in phones that have a long cord so you can carry it all around the house because we got wireless phones now. We're not going to have all that. We're not, most of us are going to have air conditioning in our house and other stuff that we didn't have necessarily in the 50s. I mean, things are different. And we live in a different world. And so maybe the church needs to look different too. Maybe it can't continue to look like it did when we were kids or when we've got those fond memories of growing up in a, in a certain Sunday school class. The times when I grew up on Sunday morning, we left the house around 8.30, we got home about 3. Because we went to Sunday school, we went to church, we went to eat or had dinner with friends, and we ended up in the afternoon about 3, and we weren't home long before I was headed back for NYF. Friends, i got to tell you, we don't get people for six hours on a Sunday anymore. When I first came to this church, I couldn't even get back in the back to say bye to people before they were gone. It was the darndest thing I'd ever seen. I was used to, you know, the preachers lining up in the back and everybody going by. Of course, what they always say is preach a really great sermon. <laughs> Sometimes they even mean that. I remember one of our when I was going through seminary, one of our young preachers was younger than me was was saying, oh, the people in my church love me. They always tell me that every week. I said, they're not going to tell you the other things when you're listening. Everybody isn't going to love you. Everybody isn't going to love every message. Everybody isn't going to love every hymn in that right end. Everybody's not going to love everything we do. That's okay, because we're going to keep doing it. Sometimes we have to push a little bit to remind us that, that we can't get stuck in a rut. We're not going to sing because He lives every Sunday. Sometimes we're going to sing songs that require us to think about what the words are. We're not going to say that just the Apostles' Creed every Sunday because you know what happens. We get to say it and we don't hear it anymore. But those things are important. It's really important that we believe in God, the, 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 the Creator. It's important that we believe in Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God, the one that comes through the, through the power of miracles, through Mary and Joseph. It's important that we believe that the Holy Spirit is this guiding force in our lives behind us. But it's also important that we do what Wesley described as using our reason to think about, well, some things are apropos now that weren't apropos then. Some things we hear differently because of where we live and how we live. We can't pick and choose which things we're going we, to... Uh, let me say that a different way. We've got to pick what hill we're going to die on. And I'm not going to die on the hill of telling everybody don't come to our church if you've ever been to a casino. I'm not going to die on the hill of saying if you ever had a drink, you can't come to this church. I'm not going to die on the hill of saying if you ever sinned in your life, you're not invited to here. Because those are exactly the people we're supposed to give this message to. How are we going to do it? Well, Jesus gives us the answer, doesn't he? We're going to be people that love people, even sometimes when we don't like them. We're going to show mercy and grace. We're going to be that second chance place. That place where we believe that God does have this, this wonderful potter's wheel where God is actually recreating people, transforming them into something new. And when we do, I believe that we're going to one day at a time, one instant at a time, change things in the world. So we've got some opportunities coming up. We're going to have this full port, not spaghetti, fundraiser. It's a great opportunity. We'll have tickets next week. You know, get some tickets, buy some tickets, invite people that you've never, ever brought to church with you. They may not want to come and hear the message or sing the songs, but maybe they'll come eat some full pork and hang out and find out that, you know, those people are okay. 
we're going to unload pumpkins on October the 8th. And, and, you know, usually we get a big crowd of people showing up on October the 8th, many more that are here right this minute. And, and when, we, when they're out here helping us, we need to tell them, you know, you're invited to come here anytime. A couple of weeks ago, I met a, well, now it's been about six weeks ago, I ran into a guy that I've known for about 10 years. I said, how's it going? He said, well, it's not going all that great. My mom lives in a nursing home. She had COVID. I'm having to figure out how to care for her, what to do with her, how to deal with her. And I said, well, you know, the only suggestion I could give you is go hang out with some people that have hope. Well, next thing I know, he showed up at church on Saturday night. First time he was kind of an observer, like people are often. Next time he kind of stood up and sang with everybody. And the next time he actually came up for communion. And the next time he came with his wife. You know, all I know is that my job isn't to ask you what caused you to come here, what made you come here. I just know that you're welcome to come here. And I'm going to make an assumption that he enjoyed having somebody care enough to pay attention to him, to love him, and care for him. Adam Hamilton said this a while back in a conversation that I, I think it's a, it's a way for us to start and end conversations. You know, sometimes there are people in your life that are just a thorn. Uh, hopefully it's none of us, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. And, and it's hard to talk to them. I mean, we got people in our own families like that where there's just such a disagreement about what's going on in the world that we really can't talk. And I wonder how many times if we started off that but in the very beginning of that conversation, you know, I really love you. I really care about you. And then after we have this maybe heated conversation at the end of it, say, don't forget it. I really love you. Maybe somehow love can transcend what nothing else can. Maybe somehow the power of the Holy Spirit can grab that love and move it into hearts in a way that nothing else can. I'm convinced that that's what Jesus did when He went to the cross for us. Is He loved us so much that he would do anything it took, even give it his own life, so that we would have a chance for salvation. I'm happy that we have that chance. I know there's a lot of people saying a lot of things about a lot of preachers right now, and I gotta tell you, I believe everybody that answers God's call to be a preacher is doing their best to deliver God's word and to help people transform their lives. I don't agree with the way some of them do it, but many of them don't agree with the way I do it. But together, I also know that when you read God's Word, when you pay attention to what God teaches us, that God's Word never comes back empty. So regardless of the way that that TV preacher or somebody else delivers the message, somebody is being touched. And those people are being touched in a way maybe I could never do it. And maybe I'm touching somebody in a way they never could. Together, we can change the world. I believe we will. I think this is a great and exciting time for the church. It's not a down time. It's a regrowth, reformatting, rerouting time. But when we hear that little voice saying, I'm suggesting a different path, maybe we should listen to it. Maybe we shouldn't just turn down the sound like I did so I don't have to hear that nagging voice of whatever that lady's name is on my GPS telling me I'm going wrong. Maybe we need to turn it up a little bit and listen to God. Because I believe God is leading us and it's my hope that we as a church and as fellow Christians will be willing to follow it. Amen? Amen. As you're able, would you please stand? Take the next few minutes to take this time to offer signs of peace and reconciliation to your friends and neighbors here in the church. Peace, Joe.
singing One Bread, One Body. Uh, the words will be on the screen. I know you're busy walking and trying to figure it all out when you're in line, but uh, the whole purpose is for us to sing, so it would be good if you did. And uh, do the best you can. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, our Alpha and our Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and the Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And in you, we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not deserve us. You made covenant with your people Israel and spoke through prophets and teachers. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And so, with the people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is Jesus Christ who called you Abba, Father. 
As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own and fill them with a longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead the same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured out upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you and he broke the bread. Giving it to the disciples, he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine that we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ in the world redeemed by Christ's blood. As the grain and the grapes once dispersed in the fields are now united on this table in bread and wine, so may we and all your people, so may we and all your people be gathered from every time and every place into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your table forever. Through Jesus Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Is not the breaking of this bread a sharing in the body of Christ? Is not the, the grape juice in this cup not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Friends, the table is prepared. Uh, we do have a few more folks today, so if you would today start off with the people on my right, and then that'll get AJ up here so she can help us sing as we get ready for that.
Friends, we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. God is constantly putting us on that potter's wheel to reshape us and reform us into a vessel to be used by God to transform the world. And aren't we thankful? In the name of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves. Amen. Amen. As we close our service, as you're able, would you please stand as we sing freely, freely.